Very welcome to the students of uh, uh, Paradox, the study association. Um, with uh, Student General together, we organized this, uh, this lecture. Stem cells, that's the topic of this, uh, this evening, are very, um, very important. Uh, it's a very hot topic uh, these days. If you uh, Google, which I did this afternoon, uh, for instance, uh, stem cell therapy, you will have uh, 100 million hits. So that's uh, really something. Um, if you're a patient, you have a disease, and you're wondering if stem cell therapy might be something for you, how do you, how do you know that? That's a very difficult question. Um, but what can be your hope? Um, and uh, w this evening, we're going to talk about facts and fiction uh, regarding stem cells. Um, luckily, we have a real expert in the field uh, this, uh, this evening among us, Christine Mummery. Um, together with a couple of colleagues, one of them, Sir Ian Wilmoth, he was the, the leader of the team that cloned, Doni, uh, the cloned Dolly, the sheep. Um, they wrote a book uh, together, which is called Stem Cells, Facts and Science, Scientific Fiction. Uh, it has been reprinted these days because it's a very popular book. Um, the first edition is freely downloadable, at least I could download it uh, very easy on my computer. There has been a second edition with Hans Klevers, whom you might know. Um, uh, with I don't know if that's freely, freely downloadable, but you can easily find it on the internet. It's a very good introduction into stem cell ther therapy. Um, professor Memory is a professor in the field of uh, developmental biology. She holds two chairs. One uh, at the Leiden uh, University Medical Center and one uh, chair she holds at the University of Twente. Um, Christine Memory was the first scientist in the Netherlands to introduce uh, human pluripotent stem cells. She's going to explain what pluripotent means, I think, uh, in, in due course. Um, so that's very important. Um, at UT, she's closely collaborating with the Lab on a Chip group of Albert van der Berg. Um, and she's growing organs, very tiny organs, uh, on a chip. Um, how this works, why you need stem cells to make those organs, what you can do with, with these little organs, she's going to explain. Um, and and uh, yeah, the, the, oh, first we get, I think, a crash course about stem, stem cells. What is a stem cell? What type of stem cells do you have? What, how can you grow them into specific cells? What can you do with them? Christy Memory, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you very much also for the invitation to come all this way eastwards. Um, so what I'm going to try and do this evening is to take you through the facts and fiction of stem cells. Uh, so you're a very mixed audience. Some of you may come because you're interested in lectures. Some you may be interested in stem cells and what they could mean in terms of therapy. Some of the students might want to know what we do actually do in the lab. So there are bits that the uh, lecture everybody should understand. There are bits that maybe only the students understand. But it's uh, meant to give you the sort of equipment to be able to decide for yourself whether something is fact or fiction. Because you see many of these things in the newspaper every day and you really wouldn't have a clue whether it's any use or not. So, um, did I mean immortality or healthy aging? So those are the sort of questions I hope at the end you'll be able to answer for yourself. But we have to start on the same page and we actually first have to understand what are stem cells. Now, um, I find this uh, very important to explain in the beginning because there's a deliberate um, attempt by some of the commercial companies that offer therapies. You mentioned it already, all these hits on, on Google, if you do Google stem cell therapy. And there's a deliberate attempt to throw sand in people's eyes so they really don't want to understand and then they might as well do it anyway. So um, what I want to do first is try to explain to you what they are. So we have, uh, the easiest to explain if you divide them into different categories. So we begin with something called adult stem cells. Now every organ in your body that can repair itself after damage has a stem cell population. That's how they repair. And because you're an adult, anything postnatal after birth, we call adult. So if you cut your skin, it repairs because you have stem cells in your skin. 
if a bit of your liver is removed for some, in some kind of operation, it will grow back on because there are stem cells. You also have stem cells in your intestine. And this is a very rapidly turning, uh, a turnover of tissue in your intestine because there's all sorts of nasty enzymes and acids that destroy the epithelium and the mucus, so you need new stem cells. This is what particularly Hans Clavers has become very well known for, these adult stem cells. And this is uh, what we call a villus in the gut. So your intestine, they have these finger-like structures to make the surface of your intestine actually bigger in the same space. So you can absorb a lot of food. So that's, that's the idea. And you can see here, this is actually a mouse made in, in, in Hans Clavers' lab. And what he did in this experiment was to label the stem cells with a green fluorescent die and you can see them here and what happens these stem cells will divide and cover the whole of this villus and then be shed off at the top so every single day millions of these stem cells divide and get shed off into your intestine so these are called adult stem cells they are important for repair processes then we can get to a, a different kind of stem cell and these are embryonic stem cells now, this is where it gets confusing uh, for some people because these are ethically sensitive and this is where the idea comes from that stem cells are ethically sensitive. The reason for that is they are derived from early embryos. So this is a human embryo about four days after fertilization. So this is in vitro fertilization, test you babies. And it develops in, in the in the culture dish, in the lab laboratory, and it develops to this stage. Now, this is a tiny little balloon. Uh, this is the outer uh, cells that will attach to the uterine wall. And this little clump of cells here is what will become the fetus. And what you can do at this stage is take these cells out of this embryo and grow them in the laboratory. And the interesting thing is you can grow them forever. They will grow indefinitely. And just like the same cells in the fetus, they will form all of the cells of your body. So that's an essential difference with an adult stem cell. An adult stem cell only forms the tissues in, which, in the organ from which it's found. And these cells will form all of the tissues in your body. So that's why there was so much excitement about them, because just think, you can make any cell of your body and then repair it. That was the motivation behind this work. But the reason they're ethically sensitive is, of course, when you take this lump of cells out of this embryo, you, you destroy the embryo. And this uh, embryo, if it was placed back in the uterus of a woman, it would develop into a baby. Therefore, it has the potential for life. And it's quite different from an abortion. When that decision to have an abortion is made, the fetus is uh, after the abortion no longer has the potential for life. So oddly enough, these embryos are more sensitive for ethical discussion than uh, an aborted fetus. So this is where the idea comes from that these, these cells are ethically sensitive, and they are. We are allowed to derive these cells, make these cells in the Netherlands. The Dutch embryo law in 2002 allows us to do this. In Germany, for example, you're not allowed uh, to derive these cells. You now are allowed to use them, but it's very, very strictly regulated. And I'll come back to that in a minute because that's been a driver behind all sorts of research, this difference in ethical acceptability. Now, this problem of the ethics was solved essentially by this man. His name is Shinya Yamanaka, and in 2007, he discovered that he could turn regular cells in your body, any cell in your body, he could turn these into what we call a pluripotent stem cell. So they look like embryonic stem cells, but they're not derived from embryos. So this is where the name pluripotent comes from. They can make all of the cells of your body. The others we call multipotent. They can make only a few cells of your body. So these are called induced pluripotent stem cells, iPS cells, or and because this was so robust, so exciting, and such new technology, in 2012, he actually got the Nobel Prize for this. This is one of the shortest trajectories to a Nobel Prize that's ever been done. And this, uh, he got it when he was 50, and he's still a very active scientist. 
So just to summarize that bit so we get it clearly in our head, these embryonic stem cells will di uh, divide indefinitely, form all the cells of your body, but they're ethically sensitive. The adult stem cells will also grow indefinitely, but they only will form the what we call the epithelial component, just one component of the tissues from which they're derived. So they're very useful. The most common one we know, of course, is a hemopoietic stem cell. So those are the stem cells in your bone marrow. For years, people have had bone marrow transplants. If they have leukemia, they get radiated to get a bone marrow transplant. It's the stem cells that they're getting, adult stem cells. And then what I showed you is the third type are these very similar, these iPS cells, very similar to, um, uh, uh, to embryonic stem cells. Now, for many, has any of you ever been in a laboratory and see cells cultured? I bet the students have. So, stick up your hand. Have you seen cells cultured? Yeah, so, so a lot of people don't know how you actually do this. So, so, we made a little movie to show you actually how this works in the laboratory. So, this is the process, essentially, of um, making stem cells. So we make iPS cells. We can make iPS cells from any of you, no problem. So it sounds really funny, but it, it's really true. So this was part of a, a, an art project we did with a, a, a British artist called uh, Charlotte Jarvis. And she had an exhibition in Leiden in which she showed this. But as part of that, she made uh, this little movie for us. And so we start off, let's say, with a sample of blood. We um, spin down. We centrifuge the blood cells, so this is uh, what the blood cells look like when you put them in a special tube. And then you put them in a centrifuge, just like uh, you would spin your, your washing, for example. And then you get these, uh, this blood splitting up into the different components. And this particular level is the, s the cells of the blood we can use to what we call reprogram. So this is how this is done. It's in this cupboard because it's all sterile. You don't want bacteria getting in because these, the bacteria would overgrow the, all these experiments. So you collect these cells and you count them. So this is a little chamber. You put them on and you can just count them, see how many you've got. And here you uh, are transferring the cells. You have to grow them a little bit. And then you have to, uh, to add in certain factors, they're called, we call them the Yamanaka factors after this name, they're little bits of DNA and we put them in with the cells. So this is how this goes, there's a lot of pipetting to do, we call it, uh, this is what we call pipetting. And then you can see which cells have actually become reprogrammed in the culture. So you do that uh, by what we call facts, you label them fluorescently and you can see this is a bunch of cells, these have been reprogrammed. Now it looks like it's on a machine, but actually they're real cells. And uh, then we have them growing in these dishes. And what we'll, you'll see now is how we actually select these colonies. So they were growing in a flat layer, and this is what the technician's doing. She's peeling off the cells she doesn't want, just as a sort of, comes off as a sort of uh, skin on your coffee. It's quite horrible, really. And um, what you see is these little tiny colonies, and they're reprogrammed skin cells. So here she's uh, washing the cells, and she will stain them and uh, then we'll be able to see their truly uh, reprogrammed stem cells. So you can see them there. These are pluripotent stem cells just made from any of you. You can freeze them, keep them forever. It's quite handy. You put them in liquid nitrogen. This is just to sort of give you an impression how we, how, what our daily life is like at the lab. TV programs always like that because it's, you know, it's a puff of uh, liquid nitrogen. So, and then we have to add all sorts of other little components, so we're trying to make heart cells. So that's what my lab, lab does, it makes heart cells from these pluripotent stem cells. And we uh, put them in this incubator, this is at 37 degrees. It's in a sort of Coca-Cola that stem cells like. Um, it's a sort of sweets and sugar, all sorts of things in it. And we just wait. We wait uh, about 6 to 10 days at this temperature, so body temperature. And that's what we get. Look, you can see them beating here. So we made these, turned these stem cells into heart cells in just a couple of weeks.
And we, can't, we don't only make heart cells, we can make nerve cells, and this is a, a big area of heart cells. We can make these from any of you or from patients um, within just a few weeks. We make neurons, brain, liver, we make them from skin, we make them from blood, we can even make them now from urine. Just pee in a pot, we'll spin down the cells and turn them into heart cells and nerve cells. Now this is quite remarkable and I hope you can understand now why Shinya Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize for this because it was really quite amazing. But what can you do? So I'm going to give you now an overview of stem cell therapy. And I hope what we can do is to tell you what we can and cannot do. Now it's quite clear that adult stem cells you get from you. So there's very little manipulation of them, so they're very safe. But do they work? I'll give you some examples of where they do work, but a lot of examples where they don't. These pluripotent stem cells are, of course, much more powerful. They can make lots of different new cells. But because we've done this, we've added in this DNA, they're a lot more risky to use in the clinic. So you always have squints, swings and roundabouts, right? So what about stem cell therapy? Let's begin by the stem cells in hair follicles. Now, I'm glad there's some elderly gentlemen here because they should be very interested in this. This is what we call a nude mouse. It's got no hair, it's got a new, no immune system. And what uh, we can do is we can take a hair from an albino mouse, so a white hair, and we can grow those cells up in a, in a laboratory culture disc like I showed you in that sort of Coca-Cola. And if you put them on a raft, they see an air-liquid interface and it will start sprouting hairs in the culture dish. So the uh, Elaine Fuchs, who's a very prominent in this area, thought, I wonder what, I, what would happen if I put those hair stem cells on the back of a nude mouse. And this is what she got, a tuft of white hair on the back of this mouse that doesn't have any hair. So this is where balding gentlemen sit up straight, but don't sit up straight because this doesn't work for you. Because these stem cells will work quite well on Burns patients, for example, but balding with age is actually a hormonal problem. It means you have too many male hormones. <laughs> That's good. So it won't work because it's like putting geraniums in a pot. If you put them in sand without any water, they just wilt. If you put them in nice moist soil, they'll grow up and make beautiful flowers. So unfortunately, your heads are like sand with no water. So they just will die again if you transplant them. But this is, um, in all seriousness, is moving towards the clinic, as I say, particularly for patients with alopecia, where they have um, yeah, all kinds of medical reasons they lose their hair, or um, for burns in patients who lose their hair this way. But this is also more spectacular. This is, again, adult stem cells. There are two examples here, actually from uh, this chap, Michele De Luca, and his wife, Graziella Pellegrini. They're in Italy, and they do two types of, of adult stem cell. One of them is for the eye. This is an eye of uh, a woman, young woman, who got a firework in her eye on New Year's Eve. And what happened, her eye got damaged, and this is the cornea, and it went completely cloudy. So this is scar tissue. She can't see from this eye. But the eye has around this, the coloured part, it has a group of stem cells called limbal stem cells. And what uh, they did was to take the limbal stem cells from her other eye, grow them out in the laboratory, like I showed you, and you put them on something that looks like a soft contact lens. You take off the old cornea that's scarred and you put this contact lens with the new limbal cells on top of the eye, and this will grow out into a new cornea. So this is her eye, same eye, five years later. It works fantastically. So this is cure. Right, so she still can see. This is another condition. There was, uh, it's a, a condition where people get very severe blistering. They have a genetic defect. It's called in a, a lamin-5 gene, that's for the students. It's uh, an important uh, protein to stick down your skin onto the basal layers. Now this chap, Julio, 
he's Italian. He was born with this defect, and this is what the skin of his upper leg looks like. There was a very prominent case of a young man uh, in Groning, I think he was. He was losing his fingers because he has this same, same uh, skin condition, and, and he died recently. Um, but this is what Julio's upper leg looked like. And now what they did was to take stem cells from his skin. I told you earlier, skin heals. Took stem cells from his skin. And the only place he had good skin was the soles of his feet. That's a different kind of skin. So they grew up his uh, stem cells. They corrected the gene. So he has a, a mutation, a f an error in his gene. Corrected the gene. Grew up these sheets of, of uh, skin. And this is his upper leg after that skin, that engineered skin, was transplanted. Now, this was just a first step. The EU then popped up with a lot of regulations. So this was done about 10 years ago. And then it took them then 10 years to get permission from the EU to apply this um, in the clinic properly. And uh, you will read in the newspapers, I think in the coming months, one of the most spectacular success stories I've ever heard of, of this group of people. This was a young boy, about six years old. He was a refugee from Iraq, fled with his family to, to Germany. He uh, had this same condition and he had no, hardly any skin at all. He was just completely raw. They kept him in a coma because he was in such pain. They again took his skin stem cells, they corrected the gene and grew them up. And they grew them up in huge sheets. So I don't know whether you know what you know, we call saran wrap or household, fo household foil, that clear. They grew them up in these sheets. And in four operations, they completely covered his whole body. This thin sheet went between his fingers, between his toes, everywhere. He's completely healed. He goes back to school now. And he has no scarring whatsoever, so he's not a burns victim. He's completely healed. And this took a very long time to get permission to do this. It will be published in Nature, I think, in the coming weeks. So undoubtedly it will get attention. So this is very spectacular uh, advances with adult stem cells. Then we get into the more difficult area. So this type of story over the years, and because of the antipathy for the ethical issues associated with pluripotent stem cells, have made people a little bit corrupt. Now, this is a case of a woman uh, in England. She had multiple sclerosis. And she was promised a treatment in Rotterdam in a clinic. This was in 2006. Now, I come from the UK, as you can probably hear. My father used to send uh, these cuttings, and this comes from a popular uh, Sunday uh, newspaper. And this is what she said. I don't know the science behind my miracle cure, and I don't care. And this is what these people play on when they're, they're trying to sell you these therapies. Because people will say, oh, it can't do me any harm. Why don't I try? In this case, this is pure hype. Um, it cost her £12,000, and they had a, a collection in the place she worked to send her for this therapy. And everybody knew, you know, it didn't work really, so she was still got MS and she has still uh, the problem. Um, and it's pure hype. Now, what happened shortly afterwards, after this uh, sort of story, was there was a woman in Rotterdam who got the same treatment, and she got really sick. Uh, afterwards, So she had to go into a regular hospital. She had a high fever. And what it turned out, that was the reason that the inspectors could go into the clinic and see what they're actually doing. And where did this cord blood, this umbilical cord blood come from? It came from India. It hadn't been tested of HIV. It hadn't been tested of AIDS or any kind of virus like that. And she was just getting it without any control whatsoever. So at this point, in 2006, the inspectors in the Netherlands put a, a moratorium on these clinics, and they've been banned. So this particular clinic uh, closed down, but uh, there was a second clinic uh, that uh, opened up. So this is, uh, what th this is the kind of story. Uh, my miracle tea bag, my miracle cells. We call this stem cell tourism. And because they were, these uh, uh, companies were banned in the Netherlands, they simply moved abroad. They moved to Germany. Because Germany said, OK, yes, we don't like embryonic stem cells because they use embryos. We'll have the adult stem cells because they're the same. And the politicians didn't get it. They didn't understand that they're not the same thing. 
So then what happened, um, this is actually from a Dutch brochure um, uh, that was called CryoSave, and they will store uh, babies' cord blood. So many, even Queen Maxima stored her, ch uh, her child's cord blood, which is a completely ridiculous idea. But th they store their cord blood and they they say it's a kind of insurance for the, for the future. And this is the, the brochure of one of these uh, companies. They say it will uh, uh, restore your brain, they will store, uh, treat Alzheimer, Parkinson, um, burns. They mixed everything up together um, just to confuse people. Uh, it's completely incorrect and totally misleading. And this is a story of a, a woman who um, took one of these therapies. So this company, CryoSave, moved to Dusseldorf and they started up there. The mayor opened the facility and this woman was a nurse who lived in the east of the country um, and she had what we call an infarct in her back. So she was partially paralyzed. She could stand but she lost uh, the, the, the full use of her lower limbs. And she went uh, to this clinic in Germany, was sent to Turkey and it was said it was supposed to be very urgent. She had to go really quickly otherwise uh, she wouldn't have an opportunity to be treated. She was treated with her own bone marrow in this case and she came back completely paralyzed, lost all use. So this woman was on uh, one of the uh, En Route Max programs say, telling about this. People are so ashamed of being to these clinics and falling for it, they will not go on the record. And um, you will find her picture in our book and to her story uh, that she wrote down. But also on that same television program was somebody who had a, mi a motorbike accident and had been paralyzed, but he could reach up. And after he'd been to this clinic, he could only do this. So he, it can be dangerous. And after two people died uh, in this clinic, two children actually, with cerebral palsy, um, they closed down this clinic as well. But they just moved off. So this particular company moved out of Germany, it was called the Excel Center. There were even advertisements for the, in the NRC and the Volkskrant quality newspapers. They claim to be bankrupt, they're not of course, they've got a lot of money, and they just moved to the Lebanon. So all of these uh, commercial companies appear all over the world. There's hardly anything you can do about it. Um, we've tried in various international fora to try and blacklist them, to list them, whatever. Um, but they just change their name and move somewhere else. So it's really hard uh, to get rid of them. So you have to understand uh, the only way to reach people is to actually tell them what's the truth and what's not the truth. So what about pluripotent stem cells? I said these had in the end, perhaps the most exciting long-term advantage. And one of the conditions that's uh, being very rapidly developed now, which has taken a lot of years, it's taken at least 10 or 15 years to get this far, is age-related uh, blindness, macular degeneration. I don't know whether anybody's got it here or has family or parents, grandparents with macular degeneration. My father had it and used to read with a magnifying glass. But basically, um, this is what you would see normally, and this is um, what macular degeneration does. You lose the middle field of your vision, and that happens. This is a cross-section of the eye, and the photoreceptors of your eye sit on something called ret retinal pigment epithelium, this layer here. And it turned out that from pluripotent stem cells, you could make these RPE layers of cells. Fantastic. And uh, the surgeons are so skilled, they could slide them under the, the photoreceptors that were dying and the photoreceptors would be rescued. So this is already uh, in clinical trials. About 80 pa patients have now been included and they test it in patients where they have macular degeneration in both eyes. So one eye is a control. Uh, and the, is untreated and the other receives the treatment. And they look at the rate of decline of vision and they found that in the majority of patients the, div the, the vision declines much more slowly um, in the patients with the treated eye. So this is going to work. It won't work if you've already got the damage but if it's very early it can save your photoreceptors and retain your vision. Other areas where pluripotent stem cells are really going to the clinic. Um, dopaminergic neural cells to treat Parkinson's disease. The first clinical trials are probably coming online next year. It's taken many, many years to make the right sort of cells um, that produce dopamine uh, for your brain. We know the transplantation works because in Sweden, more than 20 years ago, 
um, patients with Parkinson were treated with fetal neurons. So these are the fetal brain cells. They were the right type and they worked in some patients but not all. Um, of course it's not ethical to harvest uh, brain cells from fetuses so because uh, there's so many people with Parkinson's disease so people worked very hard to make these same cells from um, embryonic stem cells or iPS cells these some of these patients who got the fetal transplants and were essentially cured have died of recent years and when they've done an autopsy on these patients they can see these fetal cells still in their brain and still functioning so this can work we know how to do the transplantation we know how to make the cells they're now making the therapies safe and in at least four sites uh, in the world they're going to work together to get this into the clinic Pancreas cells for diabetes. Now, this is also advancing very quickly. We can make beautiful pancreas cells uh, from pluripotent stem cells. They, they uh, are not very mature, but the advantage of these cells is you don't have to put them in the pancreas for transplantation. We know you can put them in the liver anywhere where uh, these cells can actually taste the glucose in the blood and can produce insulin it doesn't matter where they sit you can actually even put them under the skin and they do their thing the right way and why we know it works is because you can get beta islet cells which are the cells that produce insulin in response to glucose you can get them from discarded um, pancreas that don't make it to transplantation. So we know the transplantation works, we just have to get the right cells. The basic driver behind this, of course, is the shortage of donor organs. If we had enough donor organs, of course they're the best way to go. If you've got a problem with your heart, you would um, like a new heart, that's the best way to go, or new lungs. But there aren't enough donors, so this is a good compromise. But moving towards the kidney, heart and liver, this is further away. This is going to be more challenging because those cells are more difficult to make and we're not terribly good at the transplantation surgery. So this is how you sort of stratify what the chances are of, of being cured or not. Now my area was the heart and I justified using embryonic stem cells in the very early days by saying we try and cure patients of heart problems. So this is actually a mouse heart you may not be familiar with it but this uh, area here is the ventricle it's the part of the heart that pumps the blood around the body this is the atrium pumps the blood around uh, the uh, lungs and this is a little suture in which we tie off a vessel and we give this mouse a myocardial infarction to, to uh, stop the blood supply and what we did here was transplant uh, beating cardiomyocytes that I showed you on that picture into this heart. Now these cells will stay there a very long time and uh, we've had them out there for nine months. Unfortunately though the cells survived but the mouse remained sick. Now there are a lot of reasons why this doesn't work. You have to remember this is a young mouse um, so it's actually otherwise healthy. It doesn't have atherosclerosis or high blood pressure or lots of cholesterol but nevertheless this did not work. It worked temporarily but it didn't, wasn't sustained and this is exactly what people find when they put adult stem cells into the heart those adult stem cells do not form heart cells but there are many many clinics offering to inject bone marrow cells fat cells god knows what into your heart or into your circulation to cure your heart problem the problem with the heart is it's a very placebo sensitive organ you can tell somebody they've done something fiddle with their arm and they will feel better and they will be able to do more but it's not maintained so you have to be very careful to do these studies properly so what about the other applications? So I, I think I've given you an overview of what can and cannot be stem cell therapy. I hope it's clear how you sort of um, assess whether it's going to work and most of it's asking the right people. But what we can do, and it's quite exciting, is we can do have more immediate applications. And some of them are for drug safety pharmacology. Is a drug safe? It turns out many drugs are not safe. We can do research on human disease. If you have a genetic disease, we can make stem cells for any of you and we can recreate your particular disease in a dish. So that means we could look for a medi medicine that was perfect for you. And this is where this field's going. It's really exciting. 
and this means we can develop new drugs. So I'll just give you some examples of the kind of things uh, we can do. So this is a sort of overview of how f the pharmaceutical industry is investing in drugs. So you see, um, this is the, the uh, amount they're investing is, this was actually from about 1990 to 2007. They're increasing their investment in looking for new drugs. And this is the number of new drugs coming on the market. It actually is going down. So per year, only 25 new drugs actually make it on the market. So one of the reasons they fail, there's, there's actually various phases. So firstly, they, they screen millions of compounds and they often screen them in inappropriate assays. So they don't really know what they're looking for, but they have a sort of compromised situation and then they test them in animals. But when they get this far into a phase one trial, They've invested a lot of money already. 85% of the drugs that work perfectly in a mouse model do nothing in humans. So this has already cost them here about a million euros. So this is why drugs um, are expensive. I'm sorry from Frau Fischer, but she really, a shipper, but she really hasn't got why they're expensive. They're cheap to make, but expensive to get in the clinic. And this is the bridge we want to, uh, to, to help companies get over. Can we, with stem cell derivatives, actually predict which drugs are going to work and save them this money and, and A, use less animals and B, um, get effective drugs into the clinic? But because of these expenses, it means there's few incentives to develop uh, drugs for rare diseases, so it's just not going to happen. It's far too expensive. They never get return on revenue uh, on investment. Reducing production costs is a major challenge, and what's very high on the agenda. Who doesn't know somebody with Alzheimer? I bet all of you do. Dementia is one of the epidemics of our time. We will not find a treatment for, for uh, um, dementia because it's not modelled well in, in uh, animals. And sepsis, we've looked for drugs to treat sepsis, blood poisoning, for 20 years. We've used mouse models, but they don't work. So these are the, one among the highest causes of death in, in, in our society today, and we have to do something about it. So there are no drugs for many chronic diseases. Existing drugs only work in 30% of patients. So you go to your doctor and you'll say, take this, and you take it, and it doesn't work, and he says, come back in two weeks, I'll see, see if it's got something better. It's all trial and error. And drug cider effects, you won't believe it, are the fourth leading cause of death. So people die of their, their therapy, and some of it is, is sudden cardiac death. And why is this? There's poor insight to human disease mechanisms. They're different from animals. There's a lack of personalized information. So a Caucasian reacts differently to a drug than an African-American, re reacts differently from an Asian. And, and most drugs are tested in young Caucasian males. They're not representative of the most of the population. And animals are poorly predictive of humans. And I'll try and illustrate that in a second. But is there a solution in using human stem cells or engineered tissues or organs on chip? And this is what our most exciting new uh, grant that we've received for doing research with uh, Twenta is this organs on chip initiative. So we can engineer bits of heart tissue. And I'll show you what this looks like. So engineers and, and biologists have worked together to make this contracting thing. So essentially, you might be able to wrap this around your heart to make it squeeze if you can control it. So engineering heart tissue is perhaps one way to go. What we're trying to do is uh, with a group of, uh, of people from either technical universities or stem cells, we're going to make stem cell models uh, on chips. And the reason we're going to do this is try to make bodies on chip, essentially. We're going to try and make the brain, um, the uh, heart, and uh, the gut. So brain, heart, and gut. And this is what we want to do. Um, and I'll just give you a little movie just to show you uh, what that could look like. So this is uh, the movie we actually showed at our panel. So. This is the organs we want to make. This is supposed to be a stem cell. And by doing the tricks I showed you, we turn it into a brain cell. We put this in a chip. We mix all the different brain cells up. 
we have sensing, we have these electrodes in, we can measure uh, brain activity in the future. We can make it from any individual we want. We're going to make these hearts on a chip. This is contracting muscle. It's got all the blood vessels in it. We make a sort of ECG. And this is the gut. These are the villi I told you about. We connect these chips with, uh, with uh, blood vessels and we put the microbiome in the gut. And that determines what the gut actually secrete. So this little yellow thing here is a bad molecule. And um, what, what your microbiome is doing in your intestines determines your cardiovascular health and it, it determines your brain health. So if you've got the wrong microbiome, you could become depressed, get mental illness. So what we want to do is link these three chips up and create a, a synthetic system where we can look at the interaction between these organs. This will help us understand how human organs work and it will help us understand how we can uh, create disease model and look for new, disease, new drugs. So these chips uh, look like this and we put them in these holders and we'll be able to uh, measure what they do. So this is what engineers do. Now you've got four here but we will make these thousands and thousands of these chips using a production methods, for example, like they make chips with Philips or, or any of the big engineering, ASML, uh, are making these kind of chips. And this is a, an example of what one of these chips can look like. So this was the first organ on chip ever made. It was uh, a, a lung. So um, this is a, a sort of layer that's supposed to be lung. Here is the blood vessel underneath. Here is the airway epithelium on the top. And these two channels here were sort of oscillating vacuum. So it makes it pump like a, as if it was a lung. And what they managed to do uh, in the US is model asthma, bacterial infections, all kinds of things. So they're looking for new drugs for these conditions using these uh, models. We make heart on a chip. So this is one of these models here. I think the movie starts. So what we do is we put uh, electrodes in this chip and it's a sort of like a balloon oscillating up and down. So here we've got uh, human heart cells from stem cells on top of this measuring the electrodes and we can make this oscillate at 60 times a minute like the, the human heart or faster 120 times a minute or 180 times a minute as if the heart's running and why that's important is drugs may affect you differently as if you're sitting in your chair or if you're running a marathon so we can make these chips run marathons or sit in their chair whichever we like to do. Um, and also, this is also from Twenza, we can model thrombosis on a chip. So this is a channel which has got uh, uh, the lining of the cells of the, epi of the vessels in it, and this is flowing through blood. And what you see is this lump of blood forming here. This is thrombosis on a chip. So we can model human thrombosis, we can look for drugs that to correct that thrombosis. So we're looking uh, at models for atherosclerosis, we're looking at the blood-brain barrier, we're looking at inflammation of blood vessels, that's called vasculitis. You go blind from diabetes or you lose your toes or have damaged kidney because of vasculitis and we can model that now in a dish and we can also model vascular dementia. This is where we're going to. So many people who have dementia don't actually have Alzheimer. It looks like Alzheimer but it's because their vessels are defective and there's poor blood supply to the brain and it becomes dementia that looks like Alzheimer. So we think we we can build models for this and this is what we're trying to do. So I'll get a little bit more technical here. Um, this is for the students so the rest can go to sleep if you like. Um, this is uh, what we call an electrocardiogram. So if you go to a cardiologist he'll, he'll put electrodes on your chest and this is what this looks like. And you can measure the distance between these peaks and distance between these peaks are called QT interval and it determines how your heart behaves. Now you don't have to be an expert to see uh, that a mouse ECG is quite different. Mouse heart beats at 500 times a minute. So if I put it on the same scale, you can see it's going up and down like this. A, a human's long dead at 500 times a minute. So physiologically, humans and mice are not the same. So is it a wonder we can't find drugs for the heart using mice as models? No, it isn't. So what we do is put these uh, beating heart cells on a sort of ECG and make ECGs of these cells. And it can look like this. So these peaks here, this is um, the electrical activity, but we can measure the calcium uh, activity. So that makes the heart contract. 
and the contraction. So the engineers in my lab have been building a system where we can measure these things simultaneously. And this is what this looks like. So normally in, a, in this sort of system, you see here the electrical activity goes up, then the calcium, and because of that, the heart cell contracts. So if we add a heart drug called digoxin, what happens is the electrical activity doesn't uh, change, but the calcium does, and the heart cell starts to contract more. Now, if you've got heart failure, this is what your doctor gives you. So we can see this in these cells in a dish. So the world goes open to look for better drugs than digoxin. So it can be fatal, this extension of this QT interval. We can test drugs for extending the QT interval. Past examples that have extended QT interval, drugs that have come onto the market and have killed people are some weight reducers, anti-inflammatory drugs, antipsychotics. Um, and if we can see that, it would be great. So what we've been doing here is measuring that field potential uh, at increases concentrations of a drug. And you can see one of these curves here. This is this gray area is the concentration of, of, of drug in your, in your blood. So this is getting a little bit complicated for those not familiar with it. And you can see this here. This is the concentration of, the, of another drug in your blood. And the curve goes up here. So we're predicting very well in these stem cell cardiomyocytes the effects of drug on people because this is the, the area they have their effect. So we tested 30 compounds like this completely. Uh, first we tested 12 compounds and we, we predicted correctly which would be the high risk. And then the pharmaceutical industry said, oh, you cheated. You, you knew what the outcome would be. We'll give you 30 drugs and you tell us which are the bad ones. So of these, we got 28 correct. They were incredibly impressed. And this is now moving forward to become a standard test demanded of companies uh, to test uh, high-risk drugs as they come onto the market. But we're scientists, and we were bothered about the two that we missed, right? So these are the two we missed. And this was uh, supposed to be a curve that went up in the air, but it didn't. It remained flat. That was very, very odd. Now, we knew that heart cells have something we call repolarization reserve. So they have a little uh, playing room to, to kind of fix this. So we gave them another drug, which reduces this amount of uh, play around they have. And then we got this upturn in the curve. And the reason uh, that, that, that how we got this play around was to add this second drug that blocked one of those ion channels. Now that sounds a bit, bit complicated, but any one of you could actually have a mutation in that ion channel, so an error in the DNA. That means you'd be vulnerable to particular drugs, but you wouldn't know it. So the prediction would be if we made I, uh, iPS cells from you with that mutation, and we tested those drugs. We tested, for example, this drug that did nothing in a normal patient uh, or a normal individual. Then we should see this. And that's exactly what we found. So this was a patient who did have one of these uh, mutations, had no symptoms. But look at the iPS-derived cardiomyocytes. The dose-response curve for both of these drugs we missed goes up in the air. So this person was vulnerable to this drug, but didn't know it. And that's why people go undergo unexpected uh, death um, from some drugs. And it's, you can find it back in the clinic. So this is a control group of, of patients who got this drug, Sotolol. It's a beta blocker. Some of you may take beta blockers. Now, the QT interval on their ECG was unchanged by the, by the Sotolol. But the patients with this mutation all got an extension of their QT interval, and they should not get this drug. And this is what personalized medicine can mean in the future. Your doctor will be able to say not only the drugs that make you better, but the drugs that you should not take because you're at risk. And it may be you're all fine, but maybe the Asian population is not fine. So a company that brings a drug on the market, selling it in Japan, may have terrible problems because um, it, it kills people there, not here. So the drugs that have, um, uh, uh, the sensitivity to drugs can be uh, um, increased by other drugs. I gave you an example. Natural alternative medicines are not without risk. So if you take 
perhaps, I mean, I name an example, ginseng tea or something, it could reduce your repolarization reserve and make you vulnerable to your regular drugs, so be very careful. Fever, get a high temperature. We know in the, in the hospital that pay, a cardiac patients on their own drug will suddenly be very sensitive to the drug if they get an infection. Their temperature goes up and reduces their repolarization reserve. Give them antibiotics to treat that fever. Same thing happens. Small differences in the DNA that you won't notice also give them sensitivity. So this new technology gives us a way of determining risk much better. I'll just give another example, jumping away from the heart, and this is a family with schizophrenia. So the little, uh, the black uh, filled in squares, so the circle is a woman and the square is a man. And if you're black, it means you've got schizophrenia. So this is a family uh, popped up in Rotterdam and you can see a lot of the kids have schizophrenia. It must be dreadful at Christmas in their house. The father's got schizophrenia. Um, and the, the children, most of them react quite well to drugs. But uh, in Rotterdam, Stephen Kushner made uh, iPS cells from these individuals. He put the, made the neurons, so these are actually neurons in a kind of chip format. Um, you could see the flashing here. He found um, abnormal behavior. These neurons were quite abnormal. And what he found was a protein called myelin was missing in these cultures. It was very much reduced. So he went back to the old MRI scans of these patients and found what he called potholes. So these are areas which are of demyelination. So possibly their schizophrenia is related to demyelination. So for the first time, he's been actually able to tell this family what's wrong with them. So uh, this is the, the kind of thing they could go. It doesn't cure them, but it gives them satisfaction. We really do have something wrong. It's not just a, a psychological problem. This is an example from Hans Klaver's work. So he uses adult stem cells and he gets them from the intestine. He grows what we call the epithelial cells and he grows them as organoids. Now, if you have cystic fibrosis, your organoids are different than people who are healthy. So an epithelial cell, if you give it a drug called, uh, these organoids here, if you give it a drug called forscolin, it will swell up. I'll show you how this movie goes in a minute. Um, perhaps I'll do it now, actually. So give the drug forscolin and this, uh, you get this swelling here. If you've got cystic fibrosis, there's something wrong with what we call a chloride channel and your cells your organoids, this is from a cystic fibrosis patient, they don't swell. This is a very simple assay. So what uh, Hans did was to take a cystic fibrosis patient and look for combinations of drug that made this become like this, so induce the swelling. And you can see these two drugs here induce the swelling. So they should work on this particular patient. But that's when it got complicated because um, the patient uh, that had this particular mutation was uh, called Fabian. You may have seen him on the, the real dry door. This boy, uh, when he was, um, I think he was 15, uh, he's now, now 19, but when he was 15, he was dying, no, maybe 16, he was dying of cystic fibrosis. He had something like 10 liters of diarrhea a day. I mean, this is really bad. And he was really, really sick. He has a mutation in the chlorine channel. They knew which mutation it was, but he wasn't eligible for a drug that cost 250,000 uh, euros a year to treat because his mutation wasn't on the list by the insurance company. So the, uh, the uh, hospital in Utrecht said, OK, we'll give compassionate use. And what they did was Hans made um, these uh, organoids from him his biopsy and showed that this drug should work. So that's the reason the hospital says we'll give it to him. Three weeks later, he could play football. He was back on the football court. It was spectacular. And this is when uh, Hans went public because the insurance company still refused to give him the drug because he wasn't on the list. So they, had to, they couldn't go on taking, uh, giving him the drug compassionately in the hospital, too expensive. So they had to take him off again and make him really sick. So that's when Hans went took the publicity and went to the real dry door and told this story, went to the newspapers, and the, co the insurance company was embarrassed by the whole situation, said, okay, okay, you can get the drug. But then he made a condition on it. He said, 
every, they said every patient that has cystic fibrosis um, uh, has to have this swelling test done to see if they're eligible for a drug. So there will be some patients who will not get the drug because it has no effect. It's a waste of money to give them for nothing. But the patients who are not on the list now get it in a very directed way. So this is personalized medicine and how it works. So it's just an example of, of where this can go. So this was uh, really quite amazing. So I'll give just two uh, other short examples because I'm getting near the end now. Two other short examples. This is um, in this case with IPS cells from patients with a, a neural degenerative disease. This is a very rare condition. Uh, babies born with this mutation are uh, normal at birth, but before two years of age, their brains have degenerated and they die. And the problem here is this. So this is how we look at proteins. So um, the higher the, the this uh, kind of band, this stripe, the heavier uh, 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 the protein. So you can see it here. So this is a normal protein, and this is what we call a mutant protein. So it's the erroneous protein. So the clue of this disease, is there a way I can get rid of this little band and turn it into this one? So Lawrence Studer, who did this work, found a drug that would do that. Um, and he now has permission. This was based simply on iPS cells. So you can see he added this drug here, and this is what happened. So he went from this in these cells to that. So he now has permission to treat the, any baby born with this particular drug. It's a drug that was already on the market for something else. It's called drug repurposing. It's an existing drug that you can use for something else. So um, you can say the same about aspirin. Developed as a painkiller, we now give it as an anticoagulant. That's repurposing aspirin for different, different uh, things than it was developed. Another example of repurposing, and I think this is even more spectacular, um, and this is my uh, last example of this, I think. So this is uh, ALS. Everybody, does everybody know what ALS is? It's motor neuron disease. Gradual paralysis, you die in general within five years, unfortunately. So most of it is what we call sporadic. It just turns up, you have no idea why, it's just the way it is. But there are inherited forms of ALS, and one of them is called by a mutation in a gene called SOD1. Now, if you make this mutation in mice, nothing happens. They're fine. If you have this mutation in humans, you get ALS. So what uh, Kevin Egan in Harvard did was to make iPS cells from a patient with this mutation. He corrected the mutation genetically using something called CRISPR-Cas. You may have read about CRISPR-Cas in the newspaper. And he got healthy and diseased neurons, nerve cells, from the same individual. So they're isogenic, they're the same uh, genetic background. And he found that the electrical activity of those neurons was different, caused by a sodium-potassium imbalance. So he used exactly the same technology as we use for our heart cells. So then he asked, is there an existing drug that would correct the sodium-potassium imbalance? And yes, there is. There is an anti-epileptic that works exactly the same way. This anti-epileptic corrects the sodium-potassium balance in epileptic patients. In, and in the case of his, uh, these cells, it corrected this defect. Not only that, these neurons are what we call hyper-excitable. That's very jiggly. That's not very good. If you put a magnet next to a patient with ALS, their hands go like this. This is hyper-excitability. And this drug, this anti-epileptic, corrected the hyper-excitability. So the clue of this study was there was another family with a second mutation in a different gene, right? Nothing to do with this, but he found the same sodium-potassium imbalance. So this drug corrects what we call the phenotype, corrects the sodium-potassium uh, balance without altering the gene. Right? So that's the way most drugs work, actually. They treat the symptoms, you get a beta blocker, but it doesn't correct the gene. You're still ill, 
but you don't feel it. And this is exactly what this could do. And because of this, Kevin has now got permission to take the next 100 ALS sporadic patients, so not the genetic form, to treat them in a trial with this anti-epileptic, make iPS cells from all of them, test the effect in their neurons, and to see whether the effect on the neurons correlates with uh, an extension of their normal life stand, which would be maximally five years. So this is how you repurpose drugs simply using a stem cell model. Not a single extra animal experiment was needed. Within a year of publication of this, this was in the clinic. So this is where the great potential is. So if you ask what can stem cells mean, if we're thinking about, let's say, transplantation and regenerative medicine, so we begin our lives at zero, pretty weak and wobbly, and we get stronger and stronger until we're about 20, and then we kind of get a plateau, and everything goes hunky-dory until we're about 50. And then starts a long, slippery slope to our 90s. And uh, it's the long, slippery slope downwards that's really the most unpleasant thing in life. So wouldn't it be great if stem cells could mean this? We extend the plateau period, and then at the end we tip off the cliff. I wouldn't mind going in a week if I could spend the rest of my life like that. So that's what uh, we hope for. So stem cells and drugs derived from stem cells could mean this. Extension of healthy lifespan. That's what we all want. So mortality, immortality or healthy aging, I would say healthy aging. We don't want immortality, we want healthy aging. And this is what you actually get. This is a car in Cuba. Um, and you can see this has had a very old chassis. But it goes perfectly because it's got a new Japanese motor in it. So you should see your body like this. This is a car in Cuba. Old chassis, new engine. We can give some new engines. So thank you very much for your attention. Christy Memory, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. There was a lot of science in it, a lot of... Uh, patients who get cured by, uh, by new techniques. It was very, very impressive. Um, I think there are many questions, uh, technical questions, ethical questions. Um, I, I uh, give you the space and opportunity. We have half an hour. Go ahead, please. How many cells do you need to make a beating Well, one, one cell can beat on its own. And what I often showed you was a whole group of cells. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? This is like 25 years of research. Basically, um, we ask the question, how does an embryo develop? And what signals does an embryo use to make a heart? And we know su such a lot about that, we recapitulate those steps. Um, so uh, we just add factor X, factor Y, factor Z. They're called growth factors. They're different hormones. And we can direct the cells and inform them what to do. So they make a step at a time. So they first become a sort of what we call a germ layer. It becomes mesoderm, ectoderm, or endoderm. And then if we want to make a heart, we make it mesoderm. And then we have to shove it along the next step along the route. So we add growth factors sequentially in different concentrations. And whilst 10 years ago we could make cultures that had maximally 10% uh, heart cells, for example, or neurons, we can now make cultures that contain 100% or 90% of these types of cells. So uh, it's really, um, actually, it's like trying to deconstruct a cake. So you've got your cake, and how do you figure out uh, what the ingredients are? So that's basically what we've done in 25 years of developmental biology. Mm -hmm. Is there... Is there a cooperation oh, yes, between cells? Yeah. Yes. So uh, a group of cardiomyocytes will connect just as they do in the heart. And if uh, I put an electrical signal in one end, um, the cells at the other end, which are all connected to one another, will react. So you get these fields of uh, currents going around a dish in circles or waves of contraction going around. Yes, they do communicate. Depends, of course, which cell type they are. Uh, neurons communicate with each other as well. And they also communicate with other cells. So the heart cell communicates with the blood vessels, gives them oxygen, gives them fatty acids, it gives them their energy. So we're making these complex models where the cells communicate with one another. Yes. Okay, please. 
well, how, long, how long does it take yeah. to, to uh, take a collect a sample from some uh, blood, for instance, or urine, to make a stem cell? So to, to make the stem cell, uh, it will take about three or four weeks. Um, the first colonies of these stem cells start appearing after 10 days to 14 days, and then we collect them. Um, once we've got a, a, what we call a stable stem cell, then we can make them form heart cells or neurons. So um, the heart cells will take another two weeks, 10 days to two weeks, so six weeks in total. Yeah. No, no, we reprogram them. So they're no, definitely not in the blood, and they're not in the skin, and they're not in the urine. Yes, well, it's yeah. not. They, they grow up in those colonies. So I showed you in that picture, um, the ones that are reprogrammed form these little lumps in the dish. So you just pick them out. So um, he asked whether all the cells in the colony are the same or not. So those little lumps we got. In principle, each colony comes from one skin cell or from one blood cell. So in principle, they're the same. But if you get it from skin, uh, there may be differences between the colonies because many people have DNA damage from, from the sun. The older you are, the more damage you'll have. So the, in, the colonies may not be identical, but we have to pick them out. How do you select the best colony? Yeah, so yeah. We, we do a whole spectrum of tests on them. So what we're looking for is what we call pluripotency markers to be sure they're pluripotent. They should express a certain set of genes, a certain set of proteins. Um, we have tests for that. And they should also form, uh, be able to differentiate to all the different, the major cell types. So they form neurons, heart cells, and gut cells. If they can do that, we call them a stem cell. If, if we find a colony looking like that, we've never found that they're not a stem cell. It, so that what you look at, what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Good question. Blood cells are multipotent cells because... They're not all multipotent. The stem cell population is multipotent, but they're quite rare in blood. What we reprogram are actually erythroblasts. So they are a d they're not multipotent anymore. Yeah, so, and the same is true of skin fibroblasts. <coughs> no, <sorry. laughs> yeah. But, Christy, let me, let me see if I got it. I'll come to you uh, in a moment. If I cut my finger, which sometimes happens, um, then the, the multi, uh, multipotent, multi -potent multipotent cells. cells in my skin will start repairing the wound. Yes. And the multipotent uh, s s s stem cell can develop into um, uh, skin, uh, hair, uh, muscle, no, blood the, the, or, or the, what, what, the, the multipotent stem yeah. cell in the skin yeah. can only form the multiple layers of the skin. Mm -hmm. The hair follicle has its own stem cell okay. that will only form the hair. The, hair. Yeah, yeah, the okay. sebaceous gland has its own, own stem, stem cell, cell that only forms the sebaceous yeah. gland. Yeah. So that's the clue about adult stem cells. Mm -hmm. They only f are meant to contribute to the tissue they came from. Yeah. And it can be very small. Uh -huh. Okay. The tissue. That's, that's clear. Yes, please. So he, he says, uh, I made the analogy with a car um, uh, that uh, he says, in the end, it will fail anyway. That's perfectly correct. So an old timer, you can only repair so many times. And in the end, if you know, it will just fall apart from rust. It gets beyond the point of return. So that will what happen to us. So uh, probably, you know, people make different estimates of the maximum possible age probably 150 or something, but then we'll definitely fall apart. <laughs> so yeah, he yeah. said, would you keep be able to keep on renewing the tissues forever and ever? And if you could replace all the chassis, wouldn't you have actually immortality? Mm. Um, that will be really hard. So there's, there's some cells, you know, if, you, if you're, all your heart cells start dying, uh, it will be really hard. And, and you, there's an awful lot of cells in your body, and some tissues will be really hard to repair. So there's um, the pathology. So, for example, if you have Alzheimer, you get plaques in your brain. No matter how many new brain cells you put in, they're going to die. So uh, there comes a point where you just can't paint over the cracks anymore. It's just nothing there to hang it on. <laughs> That's that's the cliff. Yes, the that's cross. the cliff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're sorry about it. Um, Christine, you said that the embryonetic uh, stem cells could go uh, divide themselves indefinitely, mm -hmm. and they could copy themselves indefinitely. But is the quality staying the same, or are they getting some kind of copy errors? 
It's a very good question. They do get some copy errors. Mm -hmm. So um, even though theoretically there are enough embryonic stem cell lines in the world never to need another embryo. So we don't need embryos every week. Mm -hmm. Thinking that uh, the law in the Netherlands was made and we could derive them, but I think we only used 100 embryos or something that were due to be thrown away, discarded, mm -hmm. yet there are, you know, several thousands of embryos per year thrown away by IVF clinics. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the older lines, the ones that were first isolated in 1998, have got errors in them, mm -hmm. um, and we generally wouldn't take them to the clinic, although there's one uh, is being used, uh, moved towards clinical practice, because mm -hmm. um, if you have a lot of these cells, only some of them get the errors, and you can make what we call a clone, so you pick one of the cells out and you make a new culture just based on a single cell. Mm -hmm. So then you do that again and you'll find some that don't have the error mm -hmm. so that you can get them back to normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please. SRL is a chip in the, in the organ on a chip yes. business. <laughs> well, we can make all these cells. So that's what I do in cell biology. I make all these cell types. But um, if you want to make a real bit of tissue, you have to have a micro channel with flow. So every organ has a blood flow. And if I just have it in a dish, it's just sitting there, there's no blood flow. So what the chips offer are, um, are multiple channels where I can make you know, a gut in which things can flow, I can make a, an airway which air can flow through it, I can make real blood or pseudo blood flow through the blood vessels. And uh, without flow and stretch and strain, which you can do in a, in a, a chip, these cells, these tissues don't behave normally. So um, if, if my heart's just beating there, an adult heart's not supposed to beat by itself. It needs a trigger. So the fact that those cells were beating mean they were very young. They were not adults. So if I'm trying to model an adult disease, they should not be beating. They should be waiting for me to give them an electrical trigger. And that's what we think we can do in chips, is make adult tissues rather than the immature tissues. Chips are different than the computer chips. Well, uh, not, they, they are slightly different. Um, they're made with uh, a polymer, so we can make them any kind of shape, and we make very tiny channels where we, we put the cells in. But they're basically made of silicon, but they do have microelectronics in them, so they have very tiny electrodes, uh, just like the, your, the chip in your phone. Um, so we can measure a sort of ECG on the, on the brain cells or, or the heart cells. Um, and sometimes we have other types of sensors, and that's where the University of Twente is so good in, making nanosensors and all kinds of properties you can measure of cells. Um, you can put those in a chip, and when I put my cells in, uh, then I can measure all sorts of properties of the physiology, what kind of products they're secreting, uh, how their their metabolism, how hard are they working. Um, if we want to uh, model a disease that's caused by a mitochondrial defect, we need to be able to measure how much energy each cell uses, and that's what the nanosensors can mean. We can build those in chips, and it gets plugged into a machine, and the machine tells us what we're measuring. Okay, good question. Centimeters, yeah, so the size is also very different. It's not comparable they're reducing to the size, so, so mm -hmm. um, they are quite big now, but they are reducing the size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you're a chip biologist, aren't you? You're a chip engineer. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Please. Um, at this point, it's possible to cure someone by replacing. Is it possible to make a new, completely new organ on basis on the stem cell? stem cell therapy? Oh, there are, there are people um, who think you can. I would think, I, I would answer, it depends how long you've got. At your age, I would say yes. <laughs> At my age, probably not. <laughs> um, but people using 3D printing, so you yeah. can certainly 3D print, you know, a, a, a meniscus or something like that. Printing a heart's really quite hard. Um, because you know you have to have living cells in it, you have to have the blood vessels, and having something that looks like a heart doesn't mean to say it functions like a heart. Um, so some organs may be possible. There are people who think you could make po possibly a kidney. People also decellularize organs, so some organs that have been donated for transplant don't make it for various reasons. They get outdated. They can take the cells out of um, the donor and put them back with the uh, recipients, uh, IPS cells, for example, there's a projects going on, but they, these are going to take 20, 30 years or something. People are trying, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Will such a uh, stem cell organ be more effective than a donation because you don't have uh, repulsion uh, effects? How do you say it? Uh, Rejection. Afstoting, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yes and no. Um, of course, when we have a donor organ, we know they're. Uh, they function because they came out of a body that was functioning. So, uh, with the the artificial bio artificial organs, as they're called, we don't really know that. So they may get to the point that they can replace it. Um, the issue is, of course, donor organs. If there was um, a sort of flurry of donations of organs, uh, then we probably the stem cell biologists would go out of business, at least for this type of thing. Um, but um, I don't know whether they would be better. Mm -hmm. They might be e as close to equivalent, and they may address the shortage of organs uh, for donation. I believe we once had a lecture, uh, I have to look back who, who gave the, the talk, a professor who succeeded in three-dimensional uh, three printing a bladder, this is a um, blast, and from own, own body cells and transplanted back into the patient, and the patient is still alive, I believe. So oh yes, yes, that's fine, but you don't die of not having a bladder. Those are spina bifida. Uh, patients uh -huh. who have no bladder control, mm -hmm. but a bladder is is not really an organ. I mean, in the sense it's sort of just a bag with some cells in it. It's not the complex functionality like a of something. a heart yeah, or a okay. kidney. So yeah. that's why I said you know, it depends what you're trying yeah. to make. A meniscus but is but equally simple. A bit of bone. You, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I come to you, but first, Dirk, go ahead. Yeah. Is it true that if you take stem cells from patients themselves, that there is no rejection issue? That's that's the ambition. Uh, yeah. Um, so there are so so many of these these uh, things are not yet uh, in in the clinic. So there is one patient in Japan who has received macular uh, the, the retinal pigment epithelium for macular degeneration from her own iPS cells. Um, the, in general, though, the trials with RPE cells are not being done with people's own cells simply because it's far too expensive at the moment. Um, but there, with the, it depends on the organs. So the eye and the brain are slightly different. They're what we call immunoprivileged sites. So once the blood-brain barrier has healed, you don't need immunosuppressive therapy. So for the eye, they're giving patients, um, for two years, they're giving immunosuppression. The Parkinson patients will also have immunosuppression for two years. It's sufficient. And that's what they did with the fetal transplants, of course. They got uh, immunosuppression for a couple of years, and the cells were still there when they died. So they do survive. For something like the kidney or the pancreas, you, it will be lifelong immunosuppression, but it wouldn't be for kind of regular diabetes. It's for the the really severe diabetes where you know you have complications, uh, unstable control, and taking immunosuppressive drugs is the least of your worries. So it depends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, please. Why are baby cords? Sorry, why are baby why, cords? Why are <coughs> yeah. Yes. Useless, Ed. And hype. Up hype okay. um, so we have uh, a national cord blood bank, and um, that's used as an alternative for to find a matched donor for people undergoing leukemia therapy or something like that that need a need a bone marrow transplant, but you can also use uh, umbilical cord uh, blood cells. So there we have a national bank for that and that works fine and it's particularly it's got cord blood from what we call difficult combinations so if you've got an African father and a Chinese mother and you need uh, a bone marrow transplant or a, a cord blood transplant you're in trouble because there aren't that many donors so that's what uh, the co national cord blank does it goes and gets cord blood from these particularly um, individuals why um, there's no point much in in um, storing your own child's blood is it's most unlikely it would ever be used. It's sort of sold as, it, as a panacea for all ills, um, but as I showed you, these, these adult cells are really only good for, um, for uh, treating blood ailments. 
And it's better often to have a donor because if it's for a cancer, the, the, um, the donor cells actually recognize the cancer as being foreign and eat them up. Whereas if it's your, if let's say it's a child with with cancer gets their own cord blood cells, they won't recognise the uh, patient, so the cancer as being um, something to as uh, you know not belonging in the body. And secondly, if you use them for uh, as an alternative to bone marrow, often one cord blood isn't enough. You, it's only good enough for a child of six. Once you're heavier than that, you'll need two or three anyway. So the chances of it ever being used are about zero. I think it's only ever been used once. Yet people pay quite a lot of money sometimes to store cord blood. It's not clear what for. It's not clear what happens to if the company goes bankrupt. Um, what happens? There's no arrangement for. So it's not really a good investment. So. Um, and I, I, I think there's only one case it's ever been used. And the risk, if it's used for uh, a cancer, is there may actually be tumour cells in the cord blood. So you've cured a child of six of their cancer, give them their own cord blood to repopulate their blood, and they get cancer back again. So there's a, a certain risk of that happening. Mm -hmm. If you're saying, I want to use a cord blood in the future for my heart, it doesn't work anyway. And it will not work, because that um, is a falsification of the data. That's a clear answer, I, uh, I suppose. Please, go ahead. Uh, for, so can you use stem cell therapy for autoimmune uh, disease like AIDS or something like that? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. We can't actually make the immune cells very well at the moment. That's one of the things we'd like to do. So you, you can, in theory, make all the cells of the body, but in practice it's hard. So we've, in my lab, we've just managed to make uh, macrophages. So we're quite proud of that. But that's about as far as it's gone. We can't make T cells, we can't make B cells. And this is again where organs on chip might be useful because what we have to create is a natural microenvironment. And that would be the organ, the thymus, or whatever place, the different cell types we can't make actually develop and grow. So this is one of the ambitions of certain people to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Christine, would it theoretically be possible uh, if I take a skin cell? Uh, put it back into the, the, the starting point, the, the stem cell. Yeah. Could, could you then make a, an egg cell and a, or a sperm cell? So is it, is that, that could mean that, yes. for instance, gay people who can't have kids can take a, s a, stealth, a cell from one guy and the other guy, uh, make them one back to an egg cell, the other one to a sperm, and then combine them and put them in a uh, draagmoeder. I don't know the English yeah, term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they have a genetically I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah th th is that, yes. is that that's well, possible. Yes yeah? and no. Okay. All, my, all my answers are yes and no. Okay. So um, if you look at the literature on the mouse, uh, people have successfully made egg cells from IPS cells from a mouse, and they have given offspring. Uh, the same is true, uh, they've also made sperm from, uh, from uh, stem cells from a mouse. And they have also given offspring. They haven't, the sperm don't swim, so you have to inject them in an egg. It hasn't yet been successful to get the egg cell from the stem cell and the sperm cell from the stem cell and then make offspring. Mm -hmm. So one of them has to be real. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think that will happen. But you do definitely need a male and a female. It doesn't work with two females because of the XX and, yes, and yeah. so you, it gets uh -huh. complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so you do definitely need a Y <laughs> somewhere and you do definitely need uh, the right imprinting. So <laughs> it, will, um, it doesn't work unless it's different genders. But if you ask, um, will it work in humans? So will you make egg cells from your urine? for example, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the extreme, or sperm from your urine. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's quite feasible. Um, we actually have somebody with an ERC grant in our department working on that right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, the human system is very different from every other species. So we can uh, get to a certain stage of egg cell development, for example, but we can't even mature uh, female eggs derived from an ovary. So we don't know how to do that, get the last stages of development. So what she's doing is building organ on chip, which is an ovary on a chip, to create that synthetic environment, which was exactly the same as your question. Mm -hmm. You've got to mimic the environment. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't surprise me um, if you could create egg or sperm at some point. Wow. That's amazing. 
Unfortunately, we have to stop because you have to go back to, uh, to Leiden again. Uh, Christine, thank you very much. It's, it was an amazing evening. You can, make, um, you can get stem cells out of urine, just pee in the pot, and then um, <laughs> it seems very put easy, it, but I think it's brain. very complicated. <laughs> yes. and, um, uh, your cells in the laboratory uh, stay in Coca-Cola, so to say, so very comfortable, sweet uh, substance. Um, you told about amazing achievement, like the boy without skin, who got a new skin and lives a normal normal life. That's 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 amazing. Uh, you talked about a body on a chip. I read about organs on a chip, but a body on a chip is several yep. organs combined together, so they are influencing each other. That's a, s a stop f step further, again. And of course, the personal personalized medicine, which is I think a very important. Uh, Development. So, thank you very much for explaining this uh, all to us. Uh, I recall the book, uh, wh Who Wants to Read More About These Technologies? Uh, Stem Cells, Facts and Scientific Fiction. That has been reprinted recently, I believe. So yeah, so 2014. And yeah. Many, most of the pictures I showed came from that book. Came from the book, yeah. So, if, Who Wants to Read More About This Fascinating Technology? Buy the book. Um, Christine, thank you very much. It was a fascinating uh, My talk. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.